Kids, you're welcome to go to Kids Church. David's going to be in the back to get you. It's going to be good. All right. Sorry about that. Um, this past week has been one filled with the shedding of innocent blood. This past week has been one filled with the shedding of innocent blood. Alton Sterling, father of five, gunned down by officers in Baton Rouge. Philando Castile, about my age, engaged to be married, had his body torn open by bullets because he was reaching for his driver's license. Two black men bereft of justice and their very lives for no reason. Brent Thompson, an officer in Dallas killed two weeks after getting married because of senseless retribution devoid of any notion of justice. Michael Kroll, an officer around my age. Patrick Zamaripa, married and father of a two-year-old daughter. Michael Smith, father of two young girls. Lauren Ahrens, about to retire. This week has been filled with the shedding of innocent blood and it's been right in front of us on TV. Instead of, because of that, instead of the normal service we had planned and the sermon I was going to preach, we're going to acknowledge as a community, a church community, the loss that we've experienced and the varied emotions we felt from the events in Minneapolis, Baton Rouge, and most recently on our doorstep in Dallas. It's our responsibility as the Christian community to decry justice in whatever form it takes. Injustice, to decry injustice in whatever form it takes, as well as to grieve and mourn with each other, with our city and with our country. Grief is where we begin. Grieving is something we don't do very well as a Christian community. Most of the songs we sing are joyful and celebrate God as creator, liberator, and joy giver. And indeed, all those things are true. But if you step back and look at that from the outside, it's misleading about the character of God. If you look at that from the outside, you might conclude that we as Christians fear pain or grief or loss, that we shy away from it, that we pretend it isn't there, that God completely removes it from life the instant you follow Jesus. I really appreciated Ng's candidacy. Uh, Candidacy, candid, candidness, sorry, candidness. I really appreciated your candidness and sharing. I don't want to sing because my best friend's mom just died, and this is hard. Scripture gives us a wide berth to grieve in contrast to the norm in Christian culture, and it gives us a wide berth to acknowledge sorrow as a community. It helps us verbalize our grief like a good song or poetry when we can't, and it does so in conversation with God. When we verbalize our grief together corporately, we acknowledge all as one that our lives are in many ways marked by pain and loss and confusion. And when we do that, we depart from the norm of Christian subculture and engage the God of the Bible, the God who is present and listens and comforts and weeps with us. Jesus wept. Don't underestimate the significance of that. There are more lament psalms in the book of Psalms than any other kind. Praise psalms, trust psalms, enthronement psalms, you name it. Lament is more frequent. Lament permeates scripture. God knew we would need it for times like this. God knew we would need it. Psalm 44, you gave us up to be devoured like sheep and have scattered us. All this happened to us, though we had not forgotten you or been false to your covenant. Our hearts had not turned back. Our feet had not strayed from your path, but you crushed us. Why do you hide your face? 
the community of Israel cries out to God, how can we deserve that? Lamentations 3. God, remember my affliction and my homelessness, the wormwood and bitterness. Surely my soul remembers, and I grieve over my loss. Psalm 42. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go and be with him? Day and night I have only tears for food. My heart is breaking. This is God's people acknowledging feelings that he is absent. Or in other words, not there to help. That he is silent. That he's not speaking but leaving, their, leaving them to their suffering. And throughout these passages, we find it is we and us, God's people, mourning together. Not at home alone. Not over TV. It is God's people acknowledging pain and dissonance in the world together and with God and to God. Acknowledging pain and hurt and sadness is the beginning of the healing process. We have to do it. We have to verbalize our pain, our suffering, before we can begin to take steps forward. And this morning, I want you to know from these passages in this section that we can and must shed tears together. We can grieve together. We can acknowledge here on Sunday morning that America and Dallas are not safe or whole or peaceful, nor are our lives, and it grieves us. And we can weep to God and with God. We can worship God in grief, hands raised and lips honest. Because what happened this week has filled us with sorrow. Racism, hate, and cold-blooded murder and revenge. And it happened in our town. We are a family united by something more powerful than any other force imaginable. God himself. Don't let fear or privacy or individualism or acceptable Christian behavior bereave you of the person sitting next to you. We can weep together. The Apostle Paul says, mourn with those who mourn. Weep with those who weep. And right now, the black community is grieving the loss of two innocent men killed because of the color of their skin, and we weep with them the Dallas Police Department was brutally attacked and we weep with them. Jesus said to his followers, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Take about five minutes, maybe three, to verbalize your sorrow and confusion before God. You can do it by yourself or if you'd like to pray with someone else, please do. I want to give us some space this morning to pray and acknowledge. If you have experienced sorrow, grief, anguish from this, let's pray to God. So, take some time. Let's pray. God, it is difficult to speak to you with the language of lament and sorrow. We're not used to it. But we come to you now and bring our sorrow to you. 
were looking at it on television, murder, and it happened in our town. And it's not okay. And it pains us and it grieves us. Would you be with us in our grief, in our mourning? Holy Spirit, guide us. Guide our hearts. Thank you for being the God who weeps with us. Jesus. Amen. Grief may be something that we felt. But I think as we watched death unfold this week, we saw again that something is terribly, terribly wrong in our country. Racial injustice was put on cruel display before us as a nation, yet again. More innocent black men were killed by the law sworn to protect them. And in our city, senseless retaliation and hatred ended five innocent lives. Anger is an appropriate emotion. We can feel angry about these gross injustices and the fact that this has been happening for a long time and far too often. Lest we forget Trayvon Martin, Freddie Gray, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Philando Castile, Jamar Clark, Eric Garner, Alton Sterling. Murder is the killing of the innocent. And murder in any direction for any reason is completely detestable and abhorrent to God and to all people of good conscience. It is in fact the first law God gives in all of Scripture. After the flood, he tells Noah in Genesis 9, Whoever sheds a man's blood by man shall his blood be shed, because in the image of God did God make mankind. Humanity is sacred to God, every single human. And the protection of innocent life is the foundation, it's the beginning. God starts there before anywhere else in Genesis 9. And this week was filled with the shedding of innocent blood. And we are right to be angry because God established justice and equity, and he demands it of his people, he demands it of his followers, he demands it of the world. Listen to Psalm 82. God takes his stand in the congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers. How long will you judge in favor of the unjust and acquit in court those who do wrong? Judge in favor of the powerless and the orphan, the oppressed and the poor man, declare in the right. Save the powerless and needy out of the hand of the wicked. Rescue them. Deuteronomy 10. The Lord your God is the God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality or take a bribe. He executes justice for the orphan, the widow, and shows his love for the alien by giving him food and clothing. Humanity, humans, are sacred to God, and He demands that all humans be treated with justice and equality. That's what this is about. Why would He mention the powerless, the orphan, the oppressed, the poor, the widows, the foreigners? Why does this come up again and again and again? It's because in Israel society, those were the people who were consistently taken advantage of, did not have a voice, and were oppressed by the elite, by the majority, and in the courts. And they were consistently robbed of the just and fair treatment that they deserved as someone created in God's image. God demands justice, fairness. And we cannot turn a blind eye to evil if we confess to follow the God who loves the orphan and the widow and the oppressed and the downtrodden in society. We cannot turn a blind eye to the fact that when you cross I-30 and go south of downtown, public services are worse. Economic and social opportunity and advancement are 20 times harder to achieve. Educational needs are often ignored by the state, and this massive system perpetuates itself generation after generation, and people are still categorized and treated by the color of their skin. Yes, there are still orphans and widows. 
in our society. And yes, in fact, black lives do matter. For many people, that's an offensive state to hear. And I see a lot of us often casually answer back, well, no, all lives matter. Well, no, all lives matter. That's what God thinks, didn't you know? But that's missing the point. That's missing the point. And I wanted to address this. So let's illustrate. Bob. Bob is sitting at a dinner table with six friends. Everyone orders their food and eventually come, and everyone orders and the food eventually comes out and everyone gets a plate of food except Bob. Bob says, Bob deserves food. Everyone at the table responds with, everyone deserves food and continues eating. Although everyone deserves food is a true statement. It does nothing to actually rectify the fact that Bob has no food. In fact, it minimizes the fact that Bob has no food and is an insult to his need. So it's kind of a silly illustration, but I hope it gets the point of, across that constantly retorting back all lives matter and fall back into rank with us and rejoin neutrality is a slap in the face to the pain and hardship so much of the black community is experiencing and has experienced in our nation. Saying black lives matter is not some statement of superiority, it is a cry of pain. We're in pain. We're suffering. Justice is miscarried. We can't be neutral and hunky-dory when our sons are being killed, when our children don't get proper education, when we as parents have to have the when you encounter a policeman talk with our kids because there's a real chance they might get shot or arrested for being suspicious. If you watch the news at all, you know these things are happening. Cell phone cameras are shining a light on the darkest corners of our country and our city. And the black community is crying out for justice. It is verbalizing pain, hurt, and systemic oppression. And it's terrifying to me that in 2016, something so self-evident as Black Lives Matter has to be said in Look at it this way, if maybe you're still not convinced. If we're constantly firing back at people with all lives matter, all lives matter, all lives matter, it's like if you went to someone to tell them that you're hurting and you need help and you need someone. You say, my husband and I are on the brink of divorce. I can't handle it. Or I have cancer and I don't know if I'm going to live. And they respond, well, you know, divorce is common. I don't know why you're talking about this. Or... Well, you're not the only person in the world to get cancer. Please get over yourself and fall under it. Everybody gets cancer. Okay, but I have cancer. And I think we respond that way because we feel confused because if it's true, that would mean that the world that I grew up in, in the suburbs, in upper middle class northeast Tennessee, that's where I grew up, it would mean that that world is not a reflection of our country as a whole. Or we feel accused because we know that white, black, Asian, or Latino, many of us are part of that cultural majority. And so ultimately we feel defensive. I felt it too. But let your guard down just a little and realize that someone, or in this case, an entire race of people image of God people are sharing their pain and the injustice in their community and that does not victimize you. That does not victimize me for them to share their pain. They are the victims. How dare we lessen that for the sake of political correctness or avoiding an uncomfortable feeling. There is a whole community of people saying together, it's cancer, it's injustice, and it's not okay. It's not okay. Things have to change because status quo hasn't done it. Welcome to your calling, church. We were right to be angry at the senseless murder this week. God demands justice. God's people crave justice. This is nearness to God. Micah 6. He has told you, O oh human, what is good. And this is what he requires of you. To do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. 
Fear the Lord if you are wise. Amos 5. Hate evil and love what is good. Turn your courts into true halls of justice. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing river. And what does Jesus say? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. Did you know righteousness and justice are synonyms in the Bible? They're used interchangeably all the time. Maybe that'll change your perspective. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. God is justice. God demands justice. And therefore, God's people crave justice. Loft, my brothers and sisters, this has to define who we are as a community. We have to work. We have to be active. We have to be intentional. We have to ensure that justice for all really means justice for all. It is our responsibility. It is our calling. It is our purpose on this earth to expand God's rule and reign. Or as we more often say, God's kingdom. That is more, that kingdom is more than just Jesus died for your sins. True and glorious, that is. It is more than that. It is a whole system of life and justice and love and unity. All under the God who delivers the oppressed and is fervent for justice among mankind. And so we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I've heard the complaint that when we talk about justice in churches, it's often nonspecific. There's not a lot of practical steps given. Right? So I want to give you a few practical steps, introductory steps, to engage this issue and be a voice and a light. First, verbalize injustice. Verbalize injustice. Give it a voice. Give it words. Words, not just thoughts. Give it words. Oppression can be a very lonely existence. And when the majority of people either don't verbalize or acknowledge your suffering or outright deny it, you and your community become an island. Verbalizing injustice builds a bridge to that island. And when we all start to do it, we don't just connect individuals we bridge communities and continents. That is a very tangible step toward unity. Stand up for the rights of the oppressed everywhere and have the courage to verbalize that systemic injustice does exist in America. It does exist in America. You may have some people get angry, at, angry with you. I can guarantee not everybody in this room is happy about what I'm saying right now. But I hope from the truths of Scripture. You've seen that this is true. But for those who are truly suffering, what you will say will mean the world to them. And that matters. Second, start interacting on a meaningful level with your brown neighbors and co-workers and brothers and sisters in Christ. Have meals, have conversation, and here's the key, listen with empathy. Cultivate the art of removing your agenda from a conversation, your political views, your life experiences, and become enveloped in what the person across from you is saying. Try to see through their eyes and experiences. You may not be able to relate to their struggles, the struggles of the black community in America in this example, but you will begin to understand, to see, to perceive what it's like, and your world will open up and all of a sudden, I'm not in Northeast Tennessee anymore. This is a foundational skill for creating unity in any context, not just across racial lines. Any context. Listen with empathy. Begin to practice this in your life, and you will have the eyes of Jesus more and more toward every human on this planet. Every human on this planet. Finally, I would encourage you to not be afraid to get involved politically. Engage school districts. Have conversations. God demands justice from those he puts in leadership. That's what Psalm 82 said. 
and we have the right in this democracy to demand justice and equality from presidents and superintendents and pastors and employers. We have a voice, and together we can make a difference. We can make a difference. We don't have to be the silent majority anymore. Dr. Martin Luther King, in his letter from a Birmingham, letter from a Birmingham jail, wrote this. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Human progress never rolls in on the wheels of, in of inevitability. Human progress, did you catch that? Never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of men willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. We must use time creatively in the knowledge that the time is always ripe to do right. If you've never read that letter, I encourage you to. I think you'll walk away from the change. In closing this section... I'm going to read a prayer called Martin Luther King from a book entitled Prayers for Privileged People. And after that, Sam is going to come up and lead the next two sections, the final two sections. Will you pray with me? Some of us are old enough to remember the balcony in Memphis, the sanitation workers' strike, the shot that broke flesh, the loss of Martin. And then the mule-drawn wagon and the funeral and the riots, the violence, the fear, and the failure. All of us know the crowd in D.C. and I have a dream. The Birmingham jail, the broad stream of violence, and his steadfast nonviolence in Albany, Skokie, and Selma. All of us know his awesome daring speech, his bravery, his hope, and his generative word. And we know the relentlessness of our government in pursuit of him and the endless surveillance and harassment of this drum major for justice. At this distance, we have little access to know how it was then concerning ambiguity and fear and reluctance and violence and injustice. We do not doubt that you have persisted even beyond Martin's passion even beyond his brilliance, even beyond his fidelity and his loss. We do not doubt that through him and beyond him, you, holy God of the prophets, are still pledged to justice and peace and liberty for all. We remember Martin in gratitude, and we pledge amid our stressed ambiguities to dream as he did, to walk as he, to walk as he walked, and to talk the talk of your coming kingdom. We pledge so sure that your truth will not stop its march until your will is done. I'll take two things, two things right from the beginning. Number one, um, if you're in a minority here, if you come from a minority community um, that's not African American, like myself, you might have heard numerous times, why, does it, why do you care? Why does this matter for you? And Aside from all the obvious reasons that everyone is created in the image of God, can I remind you that the main reason that you are here is because our African-American brothers and sisters suffered and they fought and they died so that you and I can have freedom in this nation, that we can vote, that we can live in peace, that we can work here because they suffered through it. They fought for civil rights. And so when your parents tell you or your family members tell you this doesn't matter for you, that this is a black issue, it's, n it's not. So push back, remind them that we're here because they suffered and they lived for us. Number two, let me encourage you. There are three in our community that work in various police departments in our city. We've got Josh that works at Louisville PD, um, um, Alvin that works in Collin County PD, and Jason, I don't know if you guys have met Jason, but he's been here the last several weeks. He actually works at Dallas PD, and he has lost five of his brothers. They grieve. 
even in our own community, they grieve. Every day they wake up. Every day they say goodbye to their wives or their family members, not knowing if they will come back home. And so pray for each other. Pray for these three um, specifically as they are having a hard time processing this. They are struggling. I've spoken with all three this week. They are really struggling in how to process this. Pray for their families. This is difficult for them. I want to read a passage from Isaiah 40. I believe it's going to be behind me. It says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it, Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flowers fades, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for them. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. This is the call of God that he issues to the prophet Isaiah in the midst of a people that are living in exile, in bondage. No more indictment of idolatry, no more rebuke for ignoring widows and orphans, no more calls for repentance. There was a time for that, but now is the call to comfort. 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 My people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her time is served, that there's new day is coming. In the midst of our world of exile, defined by terrorism, born of a dangerous mix of extremism and distorted religion on one end, where in our own nation, mass shootings happen at a rate of more than one per day, where young African American men are being killed as they reach into their glove compartments, and where five men who had sworn to protect us are gunned down in the streets of our own city. In that world of exile, surely that is the word that we are called to offer our world, comfort, comfort, my people. A new day is coming. Cry out, preach, tell them this is what Isaiah is called to do, and that is what we are called to do. Cry out, preach, proclaim the good news. And how does Isaiah respond? He says, what shall I cry? What shall I say? He says, all the people are like grass, dust in the wind, as the old saying goes. You know, I've read this passage numerous times especially around Advent and Christmas seasons. And every time I've heard the beauty in the word comfort there. But this week when I read it, I saw the cynicism in Isaiah's voice. What shall I cry? What shall I say? What shall we do in a world that has gone crazy? July 7, 2016, five police officers dead, seven injured in the downtown streets of our own city. June 12, 50 dead, 53 injured at a nightclub in Orlando, Florida. 
February 25th, three dead, 14 injured in Kansas. December 2nd, 14 dead, 21 injured in San Bernardino, California. November 29th of last year, three dead, nine injured in Colorado Springs. October 1st, nine dead, nine injured in Roseburg, Oregon. July 16th of last year, five dead, three wounded in Chattanooga, Tennessee. June 18th of last year, nine dead as they gathered for a Bible study in Charleston, South Carolina. May 17th of last year, nine dead, 18 injured in Waco, Texas. So far, just in 2016, as of last night, there have been 7,142 deaths caused by gun violence. That includes 318 children under the age of 11. That includes 1,547 teenagers. That includes 179 mass shootings. 171 officers sworn to protect us have been shot or killed by gunfire. 958 incidents where individuals were shot or killed by at the hands of police officers. What shall I cry? Racism? Terrorism? Extremism? Gun violence? Mental illness? Security? Do you hear Isaiah's voice? What shall I cry? And he says, the grass withers, the flowers fade. Surely we are grass, says the prophets. All people seem like grass for some reason. Hearing and seeing what's going on in our community, I kind of know what Isaiah feels like. Don't you? How does God respond? The grass withers. The flowers fade. But the word of our God will stand forever. The word of our God will stand forever. What shall we cry? What shall we preach? What shall we proclaim? The word of our God. And what does the word of our God say in the book of Isaiah? What shall we cry? Isaiah 40 says it this way, have ye not known? Have ye not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and grow weary. The young will fall exhausted, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What shall we cry? Listen to the words of Isaiah in Isaiah 43. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you, pass through, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You are precious in my sight, honored, and I love you. You, what shall I cry? Isaiah 2 says, They shall bear, beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not take up their sword against nation. They are not going to study war no longer. What shall I cry? Isaiah 58, Loose the bonds of injustice. Let the oppressed go free. Break every yoke. Share your bread with the hungry. Bring the homeless poor into your house. When you see the naked, cover them. And do not hide from your own people. Then your light shall break forth like dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. What shall I cry? Again, in Isaiah 58, If you remove the yoke from you, the pointing of your finger, the speaking of evil. 
If you will offer food to your hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light will rise in the darkness and your gloom will be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden, like the spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundation of many generations. You shall be called the repentant repairers of the breach, the restorers of the street in which you live in. That's what we cry. That is what we cry. This is what we are called to proclaim. This is what we are called to embody. Whereas the Lord tells the prophet Isaiah, in the passage that we read, get up to your high mountain, O Zion. Herald the good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem. Herald the good tidings. Lift it up. Do not fear. Behold your God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the uneven ground shall become level. And the rough places shall become plain. And the glory of God shall be revealed. And all the people shall see it together. Together, all the people shall see it together. What shall we cry? The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. Nicholas Heinen was a French journalist. He wrote a book called The Jihad Academy, The Rise of the Islamic State. He wrote a book about ISIS, and he was very familiar with it because he was captured and held captive by them for 10 months. And there's a phrase in that book that stood out for me that's so relevant for us today. It's talking about ISIS, but it says, central to their worldview is the belief that communities cannot live together with Muslims. And every day the antenna of ISIS are turned towards finding supporting evidence. But pictures of people inviting and welcoming immigrants and people that are different are troubling to them. Cohesion, tolerance, that's not what they want to see. When it comes to battling ISIS, the key is strong hearts and resilience because that's what they fear. And he concludes this way, he says, I know them. Bombing they expect, attacks they expect, but what they fear is unity. What they fear is a world that Isaiah proclaims, a world where swords are beaten into plowshares, a world where the wolf lies with the lamb, a world where they do not hurt or destroy on all the holy mountains, the world where we, the people of God, are called to proclaim, to preach, to embody the good news of the gospel. Listen, I know this will sound like Pollyanna to some of you, maybe weak to some of you, maybe naive to others, maybe dangerously foolish at worst. Through the eyes of the world, you're probably right. But through the eyes of faith, this is our only hope. It is a way that reveals the truth about life as embodied by Jesus of Nazareth, who by faith we call the Christ, the Messiah, our hope. I want to close this section with the famous words of the Christian realism, Reynold Neuber, in his 1952 classic he, in the book he called The Irony of American History. He wrote these words. He said, nothing that is worth doing can be accomplished in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in the immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, could be accomplished alone. Therefore, we must be saved by love. Whereas the Apostle Paul puts it, and now faith, hope, and love abides. 
these three. But the greatest of these is love. Is love. As Christians, we are called to proclaim and embody the good news. This is what we're called to cry out. So I'm going to invite you for a brief moment. So let's just gather in groups together. You guys have been sitting for a while. And let's just cry out to God. Maybe if you want to get in groups of two or three. And let's just cry out to God. Cry out that God, you will renew, you will remove hatred, you will bring justice where justice needs to be brought, you will bring healing, you will be glorified, you will work in your way. So I'm going to invite you to stand, find two or three people together. Would you just pray with some folks? Would you just cry out to God this morning? And then I'll come back and finish up the last time. Our Father, this morning we cry out to you. We cry out that you will bring to fruition what your word says. That you would bring healing to our land. That you would make right everything that's wrong. that the voices of the oppressed would be heard, that those who cry out in grief this morning, that you would hear them and you would minister to them. We cry out to you that, we would, that you would give us boldness to be proclaimers of your truth, that we would stand for Jesus, that we would stand for what's right, that we would stand with our brothers and sisters, no matter the cost. Help us to proclaim that news. We love you. In Jesus' name. Our scripture reading this morning, we do normally in the beginning of worship. Ng had timed it perfectly, um, not knowing yet all the events of this week, but I want us to read it together now, so I'm going to invite you to stand with me. We're going to read from Matthew 5. I'll read the part where it says leader, and you guys can read the part where it says all. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As we enter into a time of communion, can I remind you and encourage you that we have been reconciled to God because of Jesus. We were aliens. We were strangers. We were oppressed under the bondage of sin. And while we were yet sinners, not because we deserve it, not because somehow or another God looked at us and said, he deserves it, she deserves it, but when we did not deserve it, God sent his son to die. He stood in our place, gave his life. And because he died for us, 
because we have received him as our savior because he lives inside of us the rest of the Sermon on the Mount says that you are to be a salt and light a city on a hill so our communion today is not just a reflection on our own lives and our own shortcomings and how God has saved us but I want you to reflect on how God has called you as you partake at the table this morning how God has called you to be salt and light a city on a hill one that cries out with boldness with courage for those who are oppressed for those who are struggling for those who are weak the way that we do communion here at Lost Cities Thank you.